Station electrophoretogram. And I understand that that's your objection, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Blazer, any comment? No, Your Honor, I do have the original photograph, and I was intending to point that out, and I will point it out, and I'll put the original photograph on the Elmo. Sorry, the I'm sorry. I will display the original photograph on the Elmo as, at the same time. Madam Reporter, do you need him to use the microphone? Yes, I do. All right. All right, then those objections as to 1, 2, and 3 will be overruled pending court accepting the assurance that that's what will be done since that has the danger of misleading the jury. As to items 13, 14, 15, 16, the people's objection, as I understand it, Mr. Goldberg, is that the uh, blocks do not line up and there's some problem with that in your mind. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. All right. And Mr. Uh, Blaze, your, your indication is that you're going to question the witness <coughs> and bring out the fact that that's due to the bowing of the plate? Absolutely. And we agree with their interpretation. That they would line up? Except for the bowing. All right. All right. Subject to that representation, then the objections are overruled. Number 18. Uh, Mr. Goldberg, my understanding of your objection is that it is to the narrative that when a BA degrades, bands disappear from the top down, uh, that you ob object to the narrative portion, but not to the actual block diagram itself. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. And it's our position on many of these issues where there's a narrative. If I may be heard further, I don't know whether the court wanted me to. Well, why don't we use each individual, because each individual diagram or presentation is different. I'm sorry. I didn't understand what the court just said. Why don't we just discuss number 18 at this point? Well, yeah, that's what I was discussing. And as to the narrative, but so I don't have to repeat myself um, when we get to other objections that I'm making on the same grounds. The way that we presented our block diagrams and demonstrative exhibits is they don't have any commentary other than a neutral statement of what happened or what is depicted in the photograph that cannot be argued by either side as being anything other than a neutral statement that does not favor one side or the other. Or in the case of our block diagram, we didn't have any commentary at all. And we allowed the witness to simply use it for the purposes of illustrating and explaining his testimony. That is a, a proper usage of uh, exhibits such as block diagrams that are being used for demonstrative and illustrative purposes, and we don't object to the defense trying to use those exhibits for the purposes of illustrating what would otherwise be difficult testimony to under, understand, just as we did. But when they're putting a interpretive slant on it that they like and that is consistent with the arguments that eventually they want to make to the jury, that we strenuously object to. Neither party should be allowed to do that with respect to any diagram or exhibit that we create. <coughs> And particularly where that narrative slant is inconsistent with the witness's testimony is going to be testifying. Now, if they were to call their own expert to the witness stand, I think we could still object on the first grounds that they should not be able to have a narrative slant on the exhibit itself. But as to the second ground, at least they would have an expert that was going to lay a proper foundation for that comment. But they don't even have that here because Mr. Matheson does not agree with the commentary that is contained in some of these narr narrations. Mr. Blazier, I can't item believe, 18. I can't believe with their chart that has so many inconclusives that we've argued over and over again are misleading and wrong. The court ruled that that was a matter of weight. This is not argumentative. This is from the scientific literature. The fact that Mr. Matheson may not be aware of it is the very point of the cross-examination. There's no slant on it at all. This is what the scientific literature says, and it's appropriate. I certainly can ask that question. What's the source of this? The scientific literature I submitted yesterday, primarily the Sensabot article. All right, as to number 22, people's objection is likewise to the narrative, is that correct? Yes. 
as to 23, also the narrative. Yes, Your Honor. 24, also the narrative. Yes. And 25, also the narrative. Yeah, there were two narratives on that. All right. All right, Mr. Blazier. Again, those are not argumentative statements. They're observations from the block diagrams. They're taken from the scientific literature. I don't think they're going to disagree, for instance, with 22, that that B1 is a degraded BA. From that, that's by definition what the chart says. Uh, these are not argumentative. They're based on the scientific literature. Mr. Matheson is going to be free to say, I don't agree or I disagree, or there's other literature that he hasn't told us about, and that's part of cross-examination. He made, but just one additional observation. First of all, it is a selected view and a condensed view, an oversimplification of some scientific <coughs> literature that Mr. Matheson is going to distinguish. But even if it were a direct quote from the scientific literature, in other words, even if he said, uh, according to Mr. Raxel and Eames in their article, they said this and then directly quoted. That should not come in in chart form. Uh, they could cross-examine the expert on that under Evidence Code Section 721, but for parties to start introducing chunks of articles, even direct quotes, that we like and that they like has never been allowed in, in our courts of law. And uh, the court will recall that there was one instance where the prosecution marked a page out of Barry Fisher's book. I don't think that that page is ever going to be able to go before the jury. It was marked, although a, a quote from it was read into evidence because we just don't submit articles and quotations to juries to go back with them into the jury room when they are deliberating on a case. So even if it were a direct, direct quote, which it is not, I, I would still object to it. All right. Thank you, counsel. All right. As to item 18, the objection to the narrative is sustained. As to number 22, it is overruled. As to 23, the objection to the narrative as argument is sustained. Likewise, as to 24 you know, there were, and 25. I'm sorry. On 24, there was the same narrative, I'm sorry, tw uh, 23 had the same narrative as 22 with an addition. It is just the addition you want me to take out? Yes. Now that's not to say it won't come in at some later point in time. All right, as to the next series of photographs, prosecution has no objection to number one, two, three, four, five. Number six, prosecution objects to the narrative as being inaccurate. Mr. Uh, Blazier? Well, I, Mr. Matheson confirmed that, and I will go into with him what the first entry into the lab means. That's the first place the evidence is taken. Obviously, it goes through a door somewhere. I'll be happy to go into that with him. The rest of it, I mean, it's not inaccurate. He can, he can explain that. All right. Objection will be sustained as being argument. Okay. Number seven. Thing? I'm sorry. Yes. Right. yes. Number uh, five, no objection. Number eight, prosecution objects uh, on the basis of what? Number eight? That we uh, felt that number eight was argument. All right. That objection will be overruled. Number nine, there's no objection. No, we, we did object to 9, 10, and 12 on the grounds that they used this phrase, sensitive case lockers, which we felt was not a designation that this witness was going to testify to. All right. Objection will be overruled. Number 11. We objected to that. As argument. Yes. Mr. Blazier. Again, that's what we've been told by the head of the lab mm -hmm. that that area of the lab is for. That's right. why we have it in there. Objection will be sustained as being argument. Number 12, no objection. No, number 12, for the record, we lumped with number 9 and 10, which the court, I think, overruled. All right. And there's no objection to 15, 16, 17, 18. No. All right, 13 and 14. We 
objected to those on the grounds that it says lowest level of security in the lab, which is just flat out wrong and also argumentative. All right, number 14. The same objection. All right, Mr. Blazer has the 13 and 14. Of the three areas depicted in the chart, that is the lowest level of security in the lab. Mr. Matheson confirmed that. Same thing with 14. The information, as far as I know, is accurate. First of all, it doesn't say lowest of the two areas, or the three areas. I'll go into that. But it says lowest in the lab. It's wrong. It's argument. All right. The objection is 13 and 14 as the narrative is sustained as argument. All right. Number one. Swatches, series of charts. <clears throat> there are, um, we basically objected to the three charts, excuse me, four charts, uh, all on the same grounds. Number one, that this witness, uh, it, it goes beyond the scope of the direct. We did not ask him anything about this. Mm -hmm. Uh, they are free to call witnesses or recall Mr. Matheson if, if they can lay a foundation for this kind of testimony. Number two, it's speculation because there are a variety of different ways of concluding how many, ch how many swatches could be created. And number three, it's argumentative. I mean, it's basically just presenting the, the argument that the, count, that the defense can and will make later on. Uh, when they have an opportunity to address the, the jury at the end of this case. All right. Mr. Blazer, the one that concerns me is number four, chart four. Mr. Matheson confirmed that you can make 100 swatches from a milliliter of blood. You can make a lot more. All right. The objections as to one, two, and three are overruled. I'll sustain the objection as to number four for the reason that there's no standardized size of swatch. There's no standard, as far as I've heard, that indicates that there is a uh, standardized amount that's considered to be a successful swatch, et cetera, et cetera. So the objection will be sustained. If the answer is the question that you can make 100 or more, can I use it? Him or anybody else. I'm sorry? Him or anybody else, but the state of the evidence right now is that there's no foundation for it. All right. Is, is that good for all of the other things that were taken out? It says what was in the chart. That's a different story, yes. All right. No. Number uh, next matters, the uh, chart regarding the blood vial. The objection at this point is the dispute over how much Mr. Paradis is going to say was collected in the blood vial, correct? Well, there are a couple of objections. There were uh, actually four of them. One was that the amounts that were removed by Mr. Yamauchi constituting one milliliter was an approximate, and in his notes it says an approximate. So it misstates if they're trying to get it off business records, what's in the business records. Number two, the amount that was removed by, that says on the chart was removed by Mr. Matheson, 0.75 milliliters, was in fact removed by Mr. Yamauchi, and again he indicated approximately 0.75 milliliters. So it misstates that. Number three, it does not at all contain any reference to the testing that Mr. Matheson did on ABO and electrophoresis, I think on the 29th of July, where he did not record in the records how much he used, but testified uh, to that on direct examination. Number four, it does not correctly state the testimony of Mr. Paradis, who has not even testified yet, but it has not, does not conform to any offer of proof with respect to what he has said. It is argumentative, and it also is beyond the scope of the direct, because although some of these issues we went into with Mr. Matheson, and they could get into, mm -hmm. uh, they could get into you know how much he used during his testing and so on. And how we much did he not estimated? And yes, what? okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Mr. Blazer, I'm, I'm concerned about the fundamental uh, accuracy. He can challenge that. This is from their records. These are withdrawals that are in their records. If we've got it wrong, he can point it out. This is. This is our best information. This is the things they wrote down. And we will we'll do the amount taken initially subject to connection. I can make a good faith statement to the court that there's been under oath testimony that there was eight milliliters taken. They've been allowed to testify to test results with no foundation. I'm offering this as to connect up later or as a hypothetical. 
but how do we get around the comment from Mr. Goldberg that th these things are actually mislabeled as to who did what? I don't believe they are. We can go into that, and that's a proper thing to go into on cross-examination. We don't believe they are mislabeled. All right. I'll allow the uh, use of the chart uh, after the uh, appropriate questions have been uh, asked to conform with what's there. Otherwise, if I'll sustain, I'm sustaining temporarily the objection on the basis of factual accuracy. If you can link it up, if you can establish from Mr. Matheson's testimony the things that you've indicated, then I'll allow its use. But you'll need to lay a foundation for it before you can trot it out. All right, let me know when you want to bring it out, and we'll see okay. if you have the foundation. All right, as to the PCR charts, nanogram, PCR amplification, I one and two. Point of clarification. I can't use the chart at all until he testifies to all the amounts? No, not all the amounts, but the amounts that are relevant. You'll need to have some more foundation before that's coming in based upon the factual dispute that I've heard. That's the point. So let me know when you want to use it. All right, the, the uh, PCR charts, nanogram, PCR amplification one and two. Any objection? Yes, uh, we'd object on the grounds that they're beyond the scope of the direct of this witness. And also, this witness cannot lay a foundation for all of the information contained in those charts. He knows, the, in other words, he knows the number of cycles, mm -hmm. for example, 32 cycles, but he doesn't uh, know the information as to how many fragments would be multiplied uh, from the, the top of the, the chain to the bottom. All right. Do you have any, any factual disagreement or dispute with what's there? It appears to be accurate. Well, the, the, the problem is, is that Mr. Matheson is not a DNA expert. Oh, I understand that. I understand that, and I understand that he has not testified to any DNA evidence. I understand the right. scope problem. Yeah, but, but, but what, I'm, what I'm saying, Your Honor, is that if Mr. Matheson couldn't provide me with those answers when he looked at the chart, and uh, I do not know of my own independent knowledge mm -hmm. whether some of the items on the chart are in fact correct. Mr. Blazier? It's my understanding he's in charge of this lab. He's testified about contamination problems. He's testified about procedures. I intend to ask him questions about, he's testified about contamination. I'm going to ask him about those kinds of questions, and they're mm -hmm. directly relevant in, in the pre-CR process, and how that can result in contamination is directly relevant to what he testified about. All right. At, I am tentatively going to overrule the objection. I'm a little concerned about the scope problem. I agree with you that he's testified to contamination issues, however. But when we start getting into specifics of DNA and PCR process, we're in a different ballgame there. That's a guideline. All right, LAPD field manual, red binder item. Mr. Goldberg. I had a chance to give that to them. This is the LAPD field manual. It's already been marked in another form. I simply have a copy that's, that has the pages numbered. It's a little easier to find them. I, I wasn't aware of any issue regarding what the defense wanted to do, whether they wanted to introduce this entire field manual or... No, I... I assume they're going to use it for the purposes of cross-examination. Correct. Right. Well, the, the, the problem with this field manual, Your Honor, is that, as the testimony has already indicated, it is a draft manual. All right. It appears... It's not an effect. It appears to the court, however, that it is a series of articles, handouts, leaflets, et cetera, et cetera, that witnesses may be individually familiar with, but the foundation will have to be laid by the witness. Well, the, 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 Excuse me, are, counsel. Please don't interrupt me. I'm sorry. All right, a foundation will have to be laid before they can be used for cross-examination purposes. I think this is a courtesy that counsel is giving to both of you and to the court to give this to you in this form. That's my understanding, Mr. Blazer. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Let's proceed. Let's have the jury, please. You know, I, uh, I'm going to be getting to that lab chart. I need some time to, to revise the presentation. Which lab chart? The uh, levels of security, the evidence processing room. How much time do you need? And we're just talking about taking out the uh, narrative portion of it. I, I, it's more than that, Your Honor. I, I don't intend to display a big blank screen, and it's part of the presentation, so I have to rework the presentation. Well, you can ask the questions, and you do the. How long will it take you to actually re rework the presentation?
Uh, 15 minutes. That's reasonable. Your Honor, did the court have a rule on item number 18 as to the EAP? Series of uh, documents. I thought I indicated I sustained that on the basis of uh, argument. All right, we'll take a recess for 15. All right, let the record reflect. We've now been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my apologies to you for the uh, late start this morning. Uh, this morning I had to go over uh, a number of items of evidence before they were presented to you. I had to review them with the attorneys. We started that at 8 o'clock sharp this morning, so we've been hard at it. Uh, but there were a number of issues that we had to go over. My apologies to you. Uh, Mr. Matheson, would you uh, resume the witness stand, please? Good morning again, Mr. Matheson. Good morning. You're reminded, sir, you are still under oath, and he is undergoing cross-examination by Mr. Blazier. Mr. Blazier, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Matheson. Good morning. Good morning, folks. Uh, Mr. Matheson, when did the LAPD SID division begin doing DNA testing? I believe our first case was completed in October of 1993. And prior to your first case being completed, was there a developmental phase that you were involved in? There was a de developmental phase, yes. And how long did that go on for? Well, on one extent or another, for about four years, three years, something like that. What was your role in the development of that program? I was the supervisor of the unit and just uh, generally oversaw it. I was not directly involved in any of the actual uh, process or analysis. Now, when you say the unit, uh, you started putting this together four or five years before 93. What was going on during that period of time? Or did I misunderstand you? I think that's a little longer than I said, but uh, we initially, back in, uh, I believe it would have been 89, started looking at the feasibility of doing RFLP type DNA analysis in our laboratory. We worked on that for a number of years, uh, attempting to both acquire the equipment necessary and uh, bring that online. Now, when you say we, tell me what your role in that was. Well, we, meaning collectively as a unit, I was a supervisor of the unit, and there were three criminalists that were assigned to the, the project from within the serology unit. So you were, you were in charge of that project? Yes. And that was studying RFLP technology? Yes. And the lab did not go into that particular technology, correct? No, we've never done casework in that. That's correct. And what was the, what's the reason that you have not gone into that area? Well, the major reason uh, focused around uh, facility. Uh, we had a situation where we were not comfortable using the radioactive isotopes and the sort of physical layout that we had. Uh, we were not given the budget to be able to make the modifications that we needed to bring that online and decided that uh, it was not an area that we would pursue any longer. Now, is your budget established by the police department? Vaguely. Christy, go ahead and ask a question. Who sets your budget? It's the city of Los Angeles, the council and the mayor's office. Well, when you have to, to try and get funding for a project that you want to do, who do you go to? Overall. Well, ultimately, the city council. It's a extremely long process that uh, can take in excess of a year. As a matter of fact, we are about ready to start on a budget process for the 96-97 fiscal year. Now, uh, and is that one of the reasons why you're not accredited, that it, it takes too long to do that with the city? Not that it takes too long, it's just it's never been approved. Now, at some point you abandoned RFLP technology and began studying PCR technology, correct? That, that's correct. When did that happen? 
Oh, I don't know exactly. I think as we've, you know, we're looking at DNA technology in general, uh, I would say probably in 1990, 1991. And again, was that you, were you in charge of that project? Yes. And how many people were working with you on that project? I believe we had two people working on that. Initially, initially there was one, then it became two, and eventually three. Two in addition to yourself? Yes. Now, prior to the time that you started doing casework, describe just very briefly what the developmental stage was in the PCR area. Well, initially it was determining what type of equipment we needed, going through the equipment lists, getting that uh, through the, the budget process, acquiring the equipment. The criminalists that were involved uh, needed to receive training. They went out and uh, uh, received that. Eventually, once the equipment was in-house, we proceeded to set it up and uh, uh, perform the tests within our laboratory to make sure that the uh, PCR could be performed properly under our setting. Now, now that, that, that phase is called the validation studies, correct? Well, the, yes, yeah, the development of our system and then eventual validation within our laboratory. Now, what is your role today with respect to your PCR lab? Well, it's one step further away. No longer being the supervisor of the unit, I now manage the serology unit, which is one of the, the section that's involved in it. So uh, basically, there's very little direct involvement at this point. Now, do you consider yourself an expert in DNA technology? No, I do not. And during the time that you were developing the PCR program for the lab, the people that were working on that under you, did they have more experience than you or less? They had much more experience. And in the current state of your lab, who is in charge, directly in charge of the PCR lab? Well, I'd like to point out that when, we, when I mention much more experience, I mean experience in the area of PCR. Uh, currently, the supervisor of the unit is a gentleman by the name of Larry Blanton. Now, at the time you started doing casework in, did you say October of 93? Yes. I think we're going far afield at this point. We're establishing what he does at the lab, but since there's no testimony of PCR DNA testing by this witness, I think it's irrelevant at this point. Now, Mr. Matheson, I provided you with a binder this morning. Uh, have you had a chance to look at that? Well, I looked at the, opened it up, looked at the cover page, and just flipped through it. That's the extent of uh, review of this particular binder. Does that appear to be the field manual that we were talking about briefly yesterday? It appears to be a, a copy of our manual. Yes. And that's the manual you provided to us, correct? Yes. Now, did I understand you yesterday to say that uh, the field unit itself, the, the unit that goes out to crime scenes and processes crime scenes, doesn't have a manual? Is that right? Not any one other than the one that's in process, this draft one. That's correct. But that's not in effect yet? That's correct. And that's been in process for how many years? Well, I believe uh, originally we started working on it in probably mid of 1992. So there is no formal document anywhere available to criminalists who might need guidance out in the field in terms of the correct procedures to use to collect evidence. Oh. There is no manual that they can go to and look up a section that specifies a certain action or something like that. Uh, we do have some references around, but there is no manual at this point. That's correct. Is it your opinion that uh, not having a manual for your field unit is an acceptable practice? Scientifically acceptable? Oh, well. 
I think it is preferable that we have a manual. Uh, however, I believe you can still do good work and provide training and have people do acceptable work out there without having one. Are you familiar with other crime labs and how they operate? To some extent, yes. What sorts of, what other labs are you familiar with? Well, I interact with, oh, well. I interact with a lot of people in our profession in labs, <coughs> excuse me, labs all over the state. Now your lab, in terms of size of your lab compared to other labs in the state, just give me a, a, a rough approximation of where you fall. Well, we're definitely not the largest. I would say that we probably would fall, oh, maybe in the three-quarter point. Uh, there are a number of labs larger than us and many more that are smaller. Of the labs that are approximately your size and larger, do you know of any other lab besides yours that doesn't have a manual for field operations? No foundation for personal knowledge. If you know. I don't know whether they do or not. Is this a matter of some concern to you as a supervisor of the lab that there be a manual in effect for everybody to look at? Well, eventually I think it would be great. I, I think it's a good idea that we have it laid down and in that form. That's why we are working on it. Now, when you say you're working on it, is, is this draft manual available to people that want to look at it that work for you? Yes, it's out. It's not kept hidden or secret or anything, but it has not been presented. Is it kept in the crime lab truck? I don't believe so, no. Now, do you recall whether there's a provision in here that says it's to be kept in the crime lab truck? Oh, well. Yes, I do. It's in the introduction. But that's not done yet? No, because it is not a formal document of our division yet. Now, is it accurate to say that many of the things in here, however, are accepted procedures that you want your people to follow? Yes. Now, please look at page 12. I number <coughs> the pages down the lower right. Is it your current procedure that it is the job of the criminalist at the crime scene to direct the photographer in the photographer's job? It is the criminalist's job to direct the photographer when it comes to the evidence, uh, the overall documentation, and the evidence that's being collected. They do have other tasks beside that. So we're not directing all their activities, but we do direct the things that are associated with what our interest is. So in, in the area of collecting evidence that the criminalist has direct responsibility for, they're also in charge of making sure the photographer does his or her job, correct? Yes, that's part of their responsibility is to get their items photographed. Now, one of the uh, procedures you set forth in here is that ordinarily photograph numbers should correspond to evidence item numbers, correct? Oh. Yes, that's what it says. Normally, the photographed item number will correspond to subsequent booking item numbers. And is that a current procedure that you do have in operation? Yeah, we try and make them correspond. It doesn't always work out that way, but uh, just to keep things less confusing, you attempt to do that. And, yeah, the reason for doing that is to keep, or hopefully to avoid as many different numbering systems as possible for items that come into evidence, correct? Yes. That can be a source of great confusion if you wind up with a photo number that corresponds to some other evidence item that's not in that photo. Oh, well. I don't know if it's great confusion. It, it does complicate the situation slightly, but there are always references referencing a, a photo item number to a property item number. And that comes from the forms that the criminalists have available to them at the scene? <coughs> Combination of that plus the property report that's eventually written, yes. So the crime scene checklist and other forms that are available to the criminalists at the scene one of the purposes of that is to record all information necessary so that you can hook up the photos with the evidence that's collected. Yes. Now let me direct your attention to page 13. At the bottom of the page, is it your current lab's procedure to uh, have criminalists, when they conduct a search of a crime scene for purposes of evidence detection, use 
bright lights, ultraviolet lights, or alternative, alternate light sources or laser lights. These tools are all available to the criminalist if they feel it's necessary. And those tools are available in the crime scene truck, are they not? Yes. And those tools presumably are to be used when there is evidence of the type that lends itself to being looked at by these instruments, correct? If the criminalist feels it's necessary to use them, they're available, yes. And what do you use bright light, ultraviolet light, or laser light for, generally? It's compound. What do you use laser light sources for? Well, the laser or alternate light source out at a crime scene uh, mainly is used by the criminalist to look for body fluids such as semen, saliva, that type of thing. And it's also there to look for things such as shoe prints, correct? Not relevant, no, so. Oh, well. oh I, As far as shoe prints, I have never been involved with it used for that, that particular uh, technique. I suppose that it could be, but uh, the primary use of those items is the detection of uh, certain body fluids. And you would agree that at the uh, Bundy crime scene there was certainly evidence of substantial bodily fluids that had been spilled? Well, it's overpriced bodily fluids. Oh, well. There was definitely quite a bit of blood there, yes. Now, it's Accurate, is it not, that Dennis Fung and Andrea Mazzola never used any of this equipment on any crime scene they processed in this case, correct? No. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. With the Bundy crime scene. No personal knowledge. Foundation. If, if you know. Still no personal knowledge. Foundation. Do you know? I don't know exactly all the tools they use, no. Now, you were in charge of reviewing their work, were you not? Sustain. Were you in charge of reviewing the work that they did, that they did or didn't do at the Bundy crime scene? Still overall. One of my duties as supervisor of the trace unit was ultimately to review the field notes, yes. When you say ultimately, what do you mean? Well, the procedure that was in place in the laboratory at that time is that when a criminalist completed a crime scene and everything was booked, as far as the evidence goes, and the notes were completed, they were placed in a location in the trace analysis unit where our criminalist three of the field unit, a, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Raquel, would retrieve those. He would do an initial review of them and then give them to me as a recommendation as to whether or not the uh, notes should be filed or reviewed with the criminalist. And as part of that procedure, it's part of your job to review those notes as well, isn't it? If I felt so, yes. And by reviewing those notes, you would know what techniques were used at the crime scene to collect evidence or identify evidence, wouldn't you? I would know it at the time I read it if it was recorded, yes. Do you ever review reports for the purpose of assessing the performance of a criminalist in terms of whether they used the equipment available to them that might be appropriate for a particular crime scene? That is part of the review process. I ultimately, like I said, I've allowed uh, Mr. Raquel, because he is very well acquainted with field <coughs> procedures, to do the initial part of that review. And uh, that is part of what he does, is to look to see if uh, that information was noted. It is not a requirement that if a device such as a laser or the alternate light source is used out there, that that's a notation that's made. And that's a subjective judgment made by the criminalist as to whether that particular criminalist, criminalist thinks it might be useful or not. That's correct. Now, ultraviolet light is used to uh, identify dust residue shoe impressions, is it not? Well, again, the major use of that particular item, I mean, it's, it's great to have a variety of different light sources out in the field. Uh, our major use for ultraviolet, again, is for the detection of particularly body fluids, not necessarily blood. Is your understanding that the only light source used at the Bundy crime scene by Mr. Fung and Ms. Mazzola was a flashlight? No personal knowledge. If you know. If you know. Well, that's all I saw them use on the uh, TV okay. accounts and that type of thing. 
local rule. Now, also uh, talking again about page 13 at the bottom, one of the techniques that is set forth there for criminalists to perform involves wheelbase and tire tread stance measurements, correct? That's mentioned here, yes. And that would be something that they would do if there was evidence of tire tracks at a crime scene. Beyond the scope, not horrible. Horrible. That is indicated there as a technique that if they feel it's important to record, then yes, it's something that should be recorded. That was not done at the Bundy crime scene, correct? Not to my knowledge, no. Horrible. Now let me ask you to turn to page 16. That's a short page. Why don't you look at that and tell me whether that is a current policy of your lab. It is not a strict current policy, no. Now, do you think that's a desirable policy? Well, you're right. This, as many things in this manual, are guidelines, and some flexibility is needed when dealing with, with evidence. Uh, I would hate to not perform an analysis on something just because we had not yet had the opportunity to give it a barcode. Now what we're talking about, so to take everybody out of the dark, is trying to get evidence booked as quickly as possible. And by booked I mean logged in into the computer system into your secure unit at the lab, correct? Well, it's not relevant. Call secure so. Oh, well. Well, the references that we are reading from now deals with having unbooked laboratory, or excuse me, unbooked evidence in the laboratory. It doesn't specifically mention anything about uh, time frames or as soon as possible or anything like that. Well, it talks about evidence being booked at the ECU, which is where it gets barcoding, correct? Yes. Let me refer you to page 20. <clears throat> Is it your current lab's policy that criminalists in the field should not perform tests on extremely small samples where the test in the field might consume the entire sample to prevent further testing? That is what they're taught, yes. And is that a good procedure in your view? Yes. Now, there was a uh, field test performed on the spot on the Bronco by the door handle. You know which spot I'm talking about? Yes, I do. At the Rockingham scene? Yes. And that spot was also collected, correct? That's correct. And it was collected after that presumptive test was performed on it, correct? It's my understanding, yes. And the presumptive test involved touching it with a swab, uh, with a wetted swab, and adding a chemical to the swab to see if there's a reaction, correct? Adding a couple of chemicals, yes. Now, is it accurate that when that spot was then collected, there was insufficient amount of material to perform any further tests? No foundation for personal knowledge. Overall, do you know? Not specifically, no. Let's move on. Now, performing such tests can also disturb items of evidence, correct? You mean in field or laboratory? In the field. Performing a uh, presumptive blood test on it? Yes. Yes, it does. It removes a uh, small portion of it. Now, you're aware that a, a presumptive test was performed on the glove found at Rockingham at the scene? Yes. And that was at the, direc the direction of Detective Van Adder, I believe. Are you aware of that? I believe it was at the request of him, yes. And in order to do a test like that, it requires at least a minimal amount of manipulation of the item to do the test, correct? Well, you have to, to some extent, deal with the item, yes. And when you manipulate items of evidence such as that, 
you take the chance of moving evidence around that might be on it or depositing evidence that wasn't on it before on it. Well, any time you manipulate something, obviously you are going to be affecting it in some way. Uh, just the mere fact of, of touching it or moving it changes its location. I, depending on how it's done, will minimize any sort of alteration that occurs to the evidence. So would you agree that it's desirable to do as little manipulation as possible at the scene of evidentiary items such as a glove? We always strive to, to keep the evidence in its original form as much as possible. You do, though, have to manipulate them. Just a mere, uh, the mere process of collecting something, picking it up off of the ground, and placing it into a packaging type material deals with you know potentially altering something. But you have to do that. You can't analyze it in place without manipulating it. Now, please turn to page 116. Under training, that refers to criminalist ones participating in field investigations in a trainee capacity. What does that mean? Sustain. Was Andrea Mazzola's capacity on June 13th as a trainee working under Mr. Fung? I'm still reading that. Okay. Sustain the objection, so that's irrelevant. She was still a probationary employee at that time, was she not? I don't believe so, no. On June 13th? I don't know her exact start date. Uh, probation is only six months. I don't believe she was probationary at that time. Uh, I believe she testified it was a year. Are you sure about that? Yes, I'm definitely sure. Probation is six months. And when did she start? I don't know her exact date. We can resolve that. I believe she indicated she started on January 24th of 94. Does that sound about right? That could be accurate. I said I, I want to confirm that to be sure. But uh, uh. So as of June 13th, she'd still be a probationary employee, just barely? Just barely, that's correct. About 11 days away from passing probation. And probationary uh, employee, that's a civil service term, is it not? I believe so, yes. And a probationary employee can be let go or not pass probation for any reason? Well, I don't know about for any reason. You'd I have think, to. I think we're calling for a legal conclusion here. Let's not get into employment law. Does a probationary employee serve at the pleasure of her supervisor? What do you mean by at the pleasure? They can be let go for no reason. They have no civil service protection. Council, we're not going to get into that. Proceed. Looking at the bottom of that page, by the way, this is volume seven we're referring to the quality assurance and control portion of the manual, correct? Yes, that's correct. And that's one page, correct? Are we missing some of it? No, uh, I don't have the original uh, volume in front of me or notebook in front of me, but uh, uh, that's what is in this copy here. In your experience with other labs, uh, have you ever seen a quality assurance and control part of a manual that's only one page long? Well, in this state, so. Sustain, we'll phrase the question. Have you ever seen manuals from other crime labs? I have seen portions of other manuals. I don't believe I've reviewed the whole manuals or all the manuals that exist in other laboratories. As one of your, your jobs as a supervisor, does that involve looking at other labs that do things to see whether they do them better and so you can learn from them? I have reviewed how other labs do things, yes. And of the labs that you've reviewed, have you ever seen a quality assurance and control manual or portion of a manual that's one page long? It's not relevant to sustain. Now, the bottom of this one page talks about prior to approving 
and signing reports, a supervisor should inspect all case notes, photographs, et cetera. Is that a current policy of your lab? Here's Sanders, 728. Overall. Well, like I previously mentioned, we do have a uh, procedure in place for reviewing notes prior to them being filed. Uh, as far, I'm not sure what this refers to as far as signing reports. It, this was not prepared by myself, and I would reword some of this uh, in a future version. To take out having to sign it? This, no. is, this signing of reports is really not relevant to this, this person's testimony on direct examination, counsel. Your crime scene checklist has no provision anywhere on the form for a supervisor, supervisor's signature, does it? No. Overruled. No, it does not. Now, please move to page 118. Now, this is the chapter or the volume regarding record keeping and reporting procedures, correct? That's correct. And it is one page long in a form, correct? As it appears here, yes. And is this the current policy of your lab or is this the extent of the current policy of your lab? Are we talking about everything that's on the page? Yes. I'll have to read it. Mr. Blazier, what's the uh, subject matter of this portion? Record keeping and reporting procedures. Not all of the items that are mentioned here are current policy within our laboratory. Let me ask specifically about the portion describing um, all evidence collected as a result of field investigation or laboratory evidence removal services shall be accurately described on an LAPD property report. Is that current policy? Yes, it is. And by accurately described on a property report, does that include describing where an item came from? That's correct. Part of the information is to be able to place it back in its original location. Now, as th the second page of this chapter is a witness critique form, correct? Yes. Is this a form that's currently in use? Yes, it is. And the purpose of the form is to provide the form, the criminal is required to provide the form to a judge or prosecutor or defense attorney in a case where they've testified to get input as to how they did, right? They are recommended to take them with them, yes. Do they do that? Many do, yes. Are they required to? It currently is in a position where we encourage them to do it. We would like them to do it on every case. Uh, however, uh, there's not currently a, um, a process whereby if somebody didn't, they would receive some sort of disciplinary action. Is there any follow-up by the lab uh, with the court or counsel in a case to ensure that the form gets filled out? No, there is not. Is there any record kept of these forms for any particular criminalist? If they are returned to us, yes. Do you know whether forms were returned to you concerning any testimony in this case from Dennis Funk? I would be very surprised if they were turned in on this case. 
How about Andrea Mazzola? No, we, uh, not to my knowledge, we haven't received any. You've provided those forms to us? Pardon me? Have you provided any of those forms to us to fill out? Beyond scope sustained, it's irrelevant. Let me ask you to turn to page 144. And this section concerns forensic photography, correct? Yes, it does. And it indicates that acceptable crime scene photography should tell a story by itself, absent of any written or oral narrative. Is that current policy? That is what it says. Uh, I don't believe we have a policy to that effect, no. Is that a good policy in your view? The provision that says the original condition of the crime scene, the sequence of its search and recovery processing of any evidence within should be exhaustively photographed. Is that a current policy? Not relevant. It's sustained. It's beyond the scope. Policy indicates to take copious photographs. Is that a current policy? Beyond the scope. It's sustained. Isn't it one of the jobs of the criminalist to guide the photographer in performing their job? It's been asked and answered. Do you have any responsibility for determining whether the photographer does their job properly or not? Orwell, he's one of the managers. Well, for one thing, I, th we only have one photographer that works within the criminalistics laboratory. Uh, we are not direct supervisors or managers of our photographic section. Is there any written policy in that applies to him in terms of how he should do his job? Or her. Or her. Something that would exist within the photographic unit or section? Yes. I have not seen one, no. How about anywhere in the crime lab? I have not seen one that specifically delineates uh, the proper job or procedures to be used by a photographer in the field. Could you look at page 145 that talks about the procedure to use in photographing bloodstains? Is that a current procedure in your lab? Not really. Oh, Did you ask if this is policy? Yes. We, because the manual is not completed, we do not have a policy on this. The general information that's there is appropriate and accurate, but we do not have a policy. Now, one of the procedures that is described there involves taking pictures of blood stains with scales going in both directions to give some scale to a photograph that's taken of a blood stain, correct? This is referencing bloodstain patterns, not just any bloodstain. How about bloodstains? Is it your understanding that the proper procedure is to photograph bloodstains with a scale so that you can have some reference point to determine the size of a stain? Overall, the jury has already seen what we're talking about in this case. Proceed. It's good practice to have a scale in the scene whenever you're photographing evidence. And that was about, not... This is about the third witness who's testified to this. There are several photographs that don't have the scale. It's common sense argument. We all understand that it would be nice. Proceed. Is that particular procedure that has been described the procedure that is supposed to be followed by your photographers? We recommend that uh, scales be placed in the scenes when evidence is photographed, yes. When it is not followed, do you take any corrective action? Sustained. 
please go to page 151. This section deals with crime scene investigation, correct? Yes, it does. And there's a statement in there that says that statistics show that less than 2% of all available evidence is properly detected, collected, preserved, examined, and introduced in court, correct? Sustained. Do you agree with that statement? Sustained. That particular document talks about taking copious notes. Is that your current lab policy for criminals, to take copious notes? Vague, copious. What's the documentation policy? As far as crime scenes go? Yes. We wish them to record all the information that's necessary to reconstruct or place the evidence items back at the scene. Do you have any set policy in terms of how extensive their notes should be? At the current time, no. Is there anything written anywhere that tells them how to fill out the forms they have? I don't believe so, no. And there's no consistency among people in your lab about how they fill out their forms, is there? I would say there is some consistency between people. We, uh, they're trained. They go out, they see how other criminalists uh, operate, and we also want people to have some independence as to how they do their job. There are people such as Dennis Fung who do not have consistency in their forms in terms of filling out the same blanks on the forms, correct? It's argumentative. Is it a good technique to fill out a form completely. If it's an appropriate form and all the information on there is necessary, I would like it to be filled out, yes. And it's up to the individual criminalist to decide what information that's asked for on the form happens to be important. We've all seen the forms. They are, in the field, going to make decisions, yes. They're going to make individual decisions as to what should be filled out and what shouldn't. And did you review the crime scene checklist from June 13th from Rockingham and Bundy to determine whether the forms were filled out completely? I had not seen them prior to them being photocopied and distributed. So they were not reviewed, were they reviewed by anybody to your knowledge? They've been reviewed many times uh, over the course of the last nine months. They were not reviewed prior to their distribution. Now, my question was, were those forms filled out completely from your standpoint? No, they were not. Were they filled out satisfactorily from your standpoint? Using the term satisfactorily to indicate that they have what I would consider the most important information, such as what evidence items were collected, how to relate <laughs> them back to numbers and their locations, I would say as a rule that was done satisfactorily. There were parts that were missing. Now, one of the issues that's come up in this case is the identification of who collected particular stains. You're aware of that, correct? Yes, I am. And you're aware that the crime scene checklists, which presumably are the only notes that they prepare when they do their work, is that correct? Well, they also can use other blank paper or whatever, but that is available to them, yes. And that those forms were insufficient for Dennis Fung and Andrew Mazzola to go back and recreate who picked up what stain? Sustained. Did you participate in a session with Dennis Fung and Andrew Mazzola where they tried to reconstruct who did what? No, I did not. Are you aware that they had to have such a session? Sustained. It's already been testified to, Council. Were you involved in the process at all, trying to assist them to reconstruct who collected what? Sustained. How are those forms inadequate? Oh, he's testified that some of the forms were not complete. 
What stands out in my mind is the last page, which indicates the signature or a place for the person to sign it was not filled in or the date and time leaving the scene. Now, one of the sections on the form talks about whether the crime scene's been altered. You're aware of that? Yes, I am. And there's several lines available on that form to be filled out, correct? Yes, there is. It takes up a substantial portion of that particular form, does it not? Well, it takes up an area about an inch and a half on a eight and a half by 11 page, yes. Mm -hmm. And what's the purpose of that part of the form? I believe, as I testified in direct, that my understanding of the purpose of that is to record any gross information you have regarding uh, potential, you know, major changes that occurred to the scene prior to your arrival, such as a emergency unit that went in to attempt to resuscitate the victim. Uh, it's a place to record information that you acquire about alterations that occurred. Does it say anywhere in this form or any other form that it's limited to changes that are just of a gross nature? No, I was just testifying to my understanding of what that section means. Well, what are your people taught about what it means? Or are they taught? I don't believe that we've gone, you know, done a teaching session where we go line through line through the form. Uh, they learn out in the field with other criminalists in how to fill it out. And uh, the people that I have taught in that is exactly what I mentioned just now. If you know of any gross alteration to the scene, to record that there. Now, gross alterations would include moving bodies before the scene is processed? I would say that uh, is information that, that could be included in that. Now, that information wasn't included in the Bundy crime scene checklist, was it? Sustained. Rephrase the question. Was that information included in the Bundy crime scene checklist in that section that talks about an altered scene? No. No, it was not. What is the purpose of maintaining a chain of custody for an item of evidence? My understanding of the purpose of a chain of custody is so that when an item comes into court, you can establish that it is the same item that was collected at the crime scene. And that's important to establish that it hasn't been tampered with, correct? Among other things. Among other things, uh, it would it would allow you to say that it was it was under control, or you'd you'd know who had control of it the whole time. The better the chain of custody, the less the opportunity of tampering, Un undetected tampering. Is it proper procedure for a detective to take property home overnight? Evidence, excuse me. Sustained. Would you recommend that a detective take a reference tube of blood home and put it in his refrigerator overnight? Sustained. What is the procedure uh, required by the Los Angeles Police Department for booking blood vials in terms of when that should be done? I don't know the exact wording of what the current manual says, but it is to be booked as soon as possible for refrigerator storage. Do you know of any provision that says you can keep it 24 hours? No, I do not.
Is it important for a criminalist at a crime scene to try to reconstruct the state of the scene at the time of the crime? Oh. Do you mean by reconstruct to try and uh, determine in exactly what state it was at the time of the crime or? As close as possible. My understanding is, is that it is important that the criminalist uh, be aware of how it is upon their arrival and document that and collect the evidence that's there. Uh, reconstruction can occur after the fact if uh, all the information as to how it was at the time when they arrived and other information is supplied. Is it your policy that a criminalist job does not include, let me rephrase that, is it your position that criminals don't have the responsibility for trying to establish whether a crime scene has been tampered with from the time of the crime until they get there. Why don't you rephrase that? Is it the criminal's job to find out if evidence has been moved around by the police before they were called to the scene? I think it's important for them to record it if they're aware of it. Uh, depending particularly on the complexity of a scene, they're primary goal is in the documentation and collection of the evidence. If they become aware of the fact that something has been moved, uh, it should be recorded. I would not expect them, particularly in a highly complex scene, to go around and interview everybody to find out if each item was in the same place as it was when it started. How about talking to the detectives in charge of the scene to see if anything's changed, anything's been taken away? Oh, I don't think that would be unreasonable. Is that part of their job? Well, part of their job is to get an overall view of what happened with the scene from the detective. It would not be unreasonable for the criminalist to ask if they were aware of something having been altered. Now, I want to ask you some questions about uh, SID. We have that. Uh, yesterday, I showed you a couple of textbooks on uh, crime scene investigations, did I not? Yes, you did. And one of those is Forensic Science, an Introduction to Criminalistics by Peter DeForest, R.E. Genslin, and Henry Seeley. Yes, it's Dr. Genslin. Dr. Genslin. And you're familiar with this text, are you not? I've seen it, yes. And have you read portions of it? Portions, yes. And have there been times when you relied on its contents? Oh, I have referenced it, yes. Do you consider it an authority on crime scene investigations? Well, having not read it cover to cover, remember everything that it says, I can't say that everything in there is an ultimate reference, but uh, I'm sure there are many instances where it's accurate and correct. Now, are you also familiar with a book by Barry Fisher titled Techniques of Crime Scene Investigation? Same thing, I am aware of it. And have you reviewed it on occasion? I have looked things up and referenced in it. And do you consider it an authority on crime scene investigations? Well, same as the other one, without having read it cover to cover, but I'm sure there's quite a bit of information in there that's accurate. Let me ask you if you agree with the following. Nothing should ever be altered Sorry. until... Yeah, uh, page 38. Yeah, uh, it the force. Page 38 at the bottom. I don't think 
Well, let me let me show them the volume. And council, we're going to take a break of a quarter till the hour. Just here for a minute. Mr. Blazer, what's the general topic of this chapter? Uh, documentation of crime scene and evidence. Have you reviewed that section? Yes, I have. Do you agree with its contents? In general, yes. Do you agree with the statement that with respect to crime scene evidence? Still no uh, foundation to 721 is considered in the thing. Have you considered this text and relied upon it in forming your own opinion as to what's a good technique and what's not a good technique in crime scene investigation? Well, and the fact that I just read it just now, and I previously have some opinions regarding uh, good and reliable techniques, I didn't rely on this to come to that opinion. Do you agree with it, though? With well, some... Well, I'm sorry. Do you agree that nothing should be altered... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Council, an objection's been made. Oh, I'm sorry. Not relevant to the state of foundation. Sustained. As a general rule, do you believe that at a crime scene... Nothing should be altered until the position of items have been recorded in detail. I agree with that if that's possible, yes. And do you agree that every case should be thoroughly documented? I'm documented as well as possible, yes. Do you agree that thorough documentation is required for a successful reconstruction of a crime scene? I think it's important, yes. Do you believe that written notes are indispensable in any investigation? Oh. Oh. Written notes are definitely a part of a, a successful investigation. Do you believe that notes should not, I'm sorry, should be made in ink? 
I have been of a customer myself many times to do it in pencil. It makes particularly doing sketches and things easier to correct when you're in the field. Uh, from a scientific standpoint, it doesn't matter, or from a uh, recording the information, it doesn't matter whether it's an ink or pencil. Uh, when we come to this point here, as far as worrying about whether or not something might have been altered or changed by somebody, then ink would be better. And you understand that ASCLAD requires, before a lab can be accredited, that they do everything in ink. I'd have to review that section. Answer question and answer will stand. You want to ask the foundational questions? <coughs> Would it refresh your memory to look at the ASCLAD manual for accreditation? And I have checked that it's not relevant. And he also, it's also vague as to refresh memory as to what. Over. As far as the question you asked before regarding the ink yes, situation? Re regarding whether accreditation, to be accredited by this organization, you're required to use ink and not pencil. On on no. Oh, that's, yeah, like I mentioned, I'd have to review it okay. to be able to see if that's what they say. It does make reference here to... All right, no, Mr. Matthews, oh. does that refresh your recollection as to the accreditation requirements set forth by ASCLAD? In that section, yes. All right. Do you know of any noted authority or author in the field of crime scene investigations that takes the position that pencil is acceptable for crime scene notes? No, I do not. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a uh, brief recess at this time for 15 minutes. Please remember all my admonitions to you. And Mr. Matheson, you may step down. We'll reconvene at 11 o'clock. All right, back on the record in the uh, Simpson matter, all parties are again present. Uh, Deputy Magnero, let's have the jurors, please.
Mr. Matheson, would you resume the witness stand, please? The record should reflect. We have been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Mr. Gregory Matheson is again on the witness stand, undergoing cross-examination by Mr. Blazier. And Mr. Matheson, you're reminded again, you were still under oath, sir. Mr. Blazier, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Matheson, before the break, we were talking about the desirability of having criminalist notes in ink. You recall that? Yes. And it's also desirable, is it not, to have their notes in a bound volume rather than a loose leaf volume, correct? It misstates the evidence as to it's also desirable in conjunction with the prior question. Well, Rephrase the it, question. Is it also considered desirable by most authorities in the field to have work notes, field notes, in a bound volume rather than loose leaf? Sustain. Is it desirable, to your knowledge? I know that that is one technique. I don't believe that's a universal technique. Do you think it's a desirable technique? I don't believe it's necessary, no. Now, the reason for that technique is to avoid the possibility of pages being substituted without being detected, correct? That is one reason to do it in a bound notebook, yes. And if you keep loosely volumes, pages can be moved around, and you'll never know, or you may never know the difference unless you look at things like staple holes, correct? Sustain. <clears throat> Do you agree that it's a desirable practice for criminalists to have all of their pages numbered consecutively? I'm not sure that's, that's necessary. Do you understand that that's recommended by a number of authors in the field? I know I've read it in one author in the uh, text that you just showed me. And you don't require that in your lab, do you? No, we do not. Do you think it's desirable that when errors are made in reports, that they should be corrected by, not by erasure, but by lining out the error, initialing it, and writing the correction? Overall. I was going to say, in relation to reports, reports that are submitted, in that most of our reports are handwritten as opposed to computer generated, if a change is made to a, a analysis report, I would expect it to be just lined through and initialed. When it comes to field notes, uh, I don't necessarily agree with it. You don't agree that as a, as a safeguard, the same principle should be applied to field notes? They can argue that it's to safeguard. Sustain. Are field notes just as important as reports, in your view? They, they are important. They serve a different function. And is it just as important that field notes not have the appearance of being tampered with as reports? Sustain, rephrase the question. Is it just as important that the integrity of field notes be maintained as well as the integrity of reports? Overall. If you mean by integrity, that every little mark on them that's put out in the field be exactly the same as always. I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, field notes are just that. They're observations that are made in the field uh, while you're doing it or your sketches. Many times I have, in the process of making a sketch, erased things to realign walls or something along that line. Do you feel that it is preferable that criminalists not throw away pages of their notes? Rule. Yes. Do you have a rule for your criminalists that they are not to destroy any of their original notes? We don't currently have a written policy for that. Is that the policy even though it's not written? We advise people to, to retain originals, yes. Well, we, is it just something that, that they can do or, or cannot do, or is it a policy that you want them not to throw away their notes? Oh, well. Actually, that is my question. When it comes to policy, uh, it is something that we advise them that we want them to retain all their original items. If we were to be made aware that it was thrown away, we'd advise them that that's not the proper thing to do. Do you have the authority to set a policy for your lab yes. as a supervisor? Well, not as a supervisor. As a manager working with the lab director and the captain, we set policy, yes. You don't have to go through any other body to set policy for the people that work for you, is that correct? That's correct.
Now you indicated that you're also familiar with the Barry Fisher text, correct? I have seen it, yes. And who is Barry Fisher? He's currently the lab director of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department Cr Criminalistics Laboratory. And he's published this book, correct? My understanding, yes. And it's not unusual for people who do casework in labs to also do research and publish articles, is it? No, not at all. It's not unusual for them to also publish books. That's correct. And the reason that you don't publish any of your work is because you choose not to. That's, that's correct. I have not published. You have no interest in getting involved in research or putting your work into uh, print for publication? That's not my main interest, no. Now, let me show you a portion of this. I'm referring to page 42. Which volume? Uh, Fisher. Uh, let me ask you to review on page 43, starting here. So far, there's no foundation. He's asking him to review it. I assume there'll be some foundational questions under 721. What's the topic of this uh, paragraph, Mr. Glazier? Uh, essentially, thoroughness of crime scene investigation. Right. Have you reviewed that section before? I don't specifically remember if I've read that before. Do you agree with what you read? No. Oh, well. In ideal conditions, yes. That is a goal to attain. Now, do you agree that in ideal conditions, as a goal to attain, Sustain. 721, Council. I'm sorry? Foundation's missing. It's hearsay at this point. I, I, I'm asking him just a general question. You're referring to the item, though, Council. Mm -hmm. Have you relied on this portion of this text before? No, I have not. Do you agree that it's extremely important to be overly thorough at a crime scene rather than less thorough in terms of not collecting items that might later have some value? Yes, I do. It's very important that you not make judgments at a crime scene that limit what you might collect, correct? Vague, overbroad, oh, well. That's correct. The desire is to collect too much rather than too little, correct? The desire is to correct just collect just the right amount of things, but to err towards too much would be better than too little. Would you agree that, uh, particularly in a complex crime scene, you're not going to be able to figure out everything that might be relevant just by looking at one crime scene? I'd say that's true. And so as a general principle, are your criminalists trained to collect more rather than less? In other words, to collect things that maybe doesn't, don't have any relevance as they just look at them, but just to be safe because they might become relevant in the future, collect it. They are taught to err towards collecting too much, yes. Is there any limitation on laboratory <coughs> space such that they are limited in how much evidence they can collect at a crime scene? Not in any individual crime scene, no. So that shouldn't be a consideration that they use in deciding what to collect and what not to collect, should it? Well, at some point you're going to have to make a decision. Uh, obviously, it would be nice to be able to collect to use maybe as an absurd example, a home that was the scene of a crime, theoretically, if you collected the whole house, then you have then 
uh, preserved absolutely everything that's in it, that would be taking it to the extreme, and of course we don't have space for that. But I do not want a criminalist going out there and saying, well, I'm not going to pick up this seat cushion or remove this mattress because it's a large item to book. Blood stains don't take a whole lot of room to collect, do they? No, they don't. Now, the, presumably the police will keep a crime scene open for as long as your people need to process it, correct? Yes. So time limitations should not be a factor that hampers your criminalist's ability to collect evidence, correct? Not time as it comes to our access to the scene, that's correct. As a hypothetical, if you had a crime scene such as the Bundy scene where there are two victims and a possibly bleeding perpetrator in a very small area, would you agree that given those facts, you would want to collect as much evidence as possible from the immediate area of the crime scene to try and sort out what happened? Sustain. Would in a crime scene such as I've described, would it be your approach to that crime scene that since there's a lot of blood, let's not collect any of it because we're probably not going to be able to sort out whose it is? Still taking over the oh. Now, if I understood that right, you're saying not to collect any just because there's so much there? Or to collect less because there's so much there. Oh, I'd make some decision as to what I thought were the appropriate items to collect. I wouldn't just ignore it, no. Wouldn't you make every effort to find out, if you could, the source of any particular blood stain? Any particular blood stain? It's a process of looking at the whole scene. <laughs> Obviously, if I see an area that appears to be a continuation of a blood pool or running or something like that from the victim, uh, I would want to collect one sample of that, like I mentioned before, and I would not then collect bits and pieces from all parts of it. However, if I saw a stain that was separate from the crime, immediate crime scene or something that appeared to be out of place, I would definitely want to collect that one. Now, I'd like to ask you some questions about uh, security at SID. <coughs> If we could use the uh, LAPD scientific investigation slide to start. Yes. <coughs> uh, Mr. Matheson, you can see the slide on the monitor. Yes, I can. And that's a uh, picture of a floor plan that appears mm -hmm. in the lobby of your lab, correct? Yes, it's a floor plan there as part of the fire alarm system. And that's fr it's from that diagram that the prosecution's diagram that they brought in here was made, correct? Is that your understanding? I don't know if it's specifically from that one, but it is similar to it, yes. Okay. Mr. Blazier, how do you want to mark these? Um, this will be... We are able to print this all out, and, and <coughs> can we have a number for a complete exhibit? I'm sorry? 1127. Right, let's make this 1127A through whatever. Okay. All right, the series. This right. would be B then. I'm sorry. Yeah, this would be B. We have C. Now, in the area indicated on the diagram is the area of the evidence processing room. It, actually, it's up in the upper right-hand corner of that black box, correct? If you look at the diagram, the actual evidence processing, there's a heavy black box that yes. actually encompasses the evidence processing room, our stock room, and a couple of office areas. The actual evidence processing room is just the smaller square in the upper right-hand corner of that. Now, there's an indication of a, uh, a door on the right side of the evidence processing room, correct? Yes. And that's a door that actually it's almost like a garage door that rolls up. That's correct. It's like an industrial uh, roll-up metal door. And that's the largest door in this building to the outside world, is it not? 
I don't believe it is in the building. It's one of two large doors from our facility that goes uh, outside of the facility. Next slide. This is slide D, S, D, D, D. Now indicated on this diagram is the highlighted area, which is the evidence control unit, correct? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Go to slide uh, E. I'm going to remove the background from that and talk about the evidence processing room first. Now, is it accurate to say when evidence is in this particular room, it hasn't been booked yet? That's correct. And there is a barcoding system for boxes that contain exhibits within LAPD, correct? Well, there's a barcoding system for boxes and packages within our division, not within the whole department. And when items of evidence are in the evidence processing room, they are not, initially, before they've been booked, they have not been entered into the computer system, correct? That's correct. Now, I want to talk about the evidence control unit. <clears throat> now, once evidence is moved to the evidence control unit is when it is entered into the LAPD computer system for tracking, is that correct? When it's booked in, it is, that's correct. And that's known as the SETS, S-E-T system? The that's one system? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, that's one system? Yes, the SETS, it would refer to as SETS system, is the Scientific Investigation Division's evidence tracking system. And that's a special system that you have set up, or LAPD has set up, to track items that are being, or, or in the process of being examined or held by SID. Well, it doesn't track items, it tracks packages of items. It could be a single item if there's only one in there, or if it's a large box that has 20 or 30 items in it, it will track the box. Now, items uh, that are in the evidence control unit, by the time they get there, they are also entered into a system called APIMS, correct? A-P-I-M-S? It's my understanding at some point that you get entered into that system. And is also correct, is it not, that the evidence control unit has a higher level of security than the evidence processing room. When you mean higher level of security, I'm assuming you mean a fewer number of people have access to it? Yes. Th that is a fact, yes. And you're required to log in and out of that room individually, correct? Well, you use your uh, access card, that's correct. Now, when I say individually, <laughs> it's, it, it's accurate, is it not, that Getting in and out of the evidence control unit is uh, more limited than it is getting into the evidence processing room. More limited in the number of people that can go in, yes. Well, you also can't, you're not allowed in the evidence control unit to walk in with somebody who has a badge to get in without also putting your ID card in the computer system, correct? People are supposed to card in and out, yes, individually. Uh, is it your understanding that as a practice they don't? That's not my understanding, no. I would assume that it does happen sometimes. So that... Oh, well. So the, the appropriate procedure is if there were two people who were authorized to be in the evidence control unit, they both have to, in, in essence, log in and out of that room by putting their ID card up on the wall by the door. There's, they're supposed to show their card to the reader, yes. Whereas in the evidence processing room, one person can get into the room with the card, and if there are three or four other people with that person, each one is not required to log in, correct? That's correct. Now, there is an additional level of security within the evidence control unit, is there not? 
in the if you're referring to there's additionally locked areas yes and if we can go to the next slide and the next now there is an area within the evidence control unit where certain cases are kept separately from other cases within the evidence control unit correct my knowledge of those particular lockers is that it's only been used in one particular case. Uh, beyond that, I have no individual knowledge of it. It was used in this particular case, correct? Yes. And the only people that have access to the evidence <coughs> control unit are authorized police officials or people that are in there with their permission, correct? I'm not sure what you mean by police officials. The people that have access to it, the employees that work in that area can get into it and they can allow other people that are authorized by them to enter the area. And the reason that cases or this case, the evidence from this case is kept in those lockers is to provide an additional level of security so that police officers or others who have access to the evidence control unit cannot get to it. It provides just one little bit more, or one little, <clears throat> excuse me, greater level of security for the shelf storage items in this case that uh, are placed in that locker. And it's to keep it secure from police officers, correct? It also is to keep it secure from anybody that doesn't have access to the key. Mm -hmm. Now, the card that's used to get in and out of the lab. Uh, anybody who, actually, who possesses that card can get into the lab, correct? Let me, let me narrow that down a little bit. At night, let's say. Uh, is there a guard on duty at the lab? No, there is not. So if someone wanted to come into the lab at night and had the card, uh, there is no method for any kind of identification of that person visually. That's correct. And there is no method for leaving a fingerprint or some other means of uniquely <coughs> identifying a person other than just having this card, correct? No, this is irrelevant. Oh, well. The, if a person has access to that door at that time of day, the computer records the code number on that card, uh, but it does nothing else beyond that as far as saying that, you know, it doesn't know that that's the person that's carrying it. It Correct. records the card information. Now, how many people have cards that provide access to the, the lab itself, the, the overall lab? I believe currently we have probably between oh, 75 and 90 people, I believe, that have cards. And does that include, uh, well, tell me who that includes, just in general categories. Well, it includes criminalists, it includes our property officers, other support personnel that work within our laboratory, our student workers, our, <coughs> excuse me, uh, clerical staff, the administration, and our uh, couriers. Now, it includes the management personnel of the lab, correct? That's correct. I mean, you have one. Yes. Michelle Kessler has one. Yes. And are there any other, uh, uh, the captain of the police department that's in charge of the lab has one, I assume? That's correct. His office is inside of that facility. Do any other uh, higher police officials have cards that allow access to the lab in general? At the current time, I don't believe so. At one point, we had one issued to a commander, but the person currently in that position chose not to take one. Now, would it be accurate to say that of the three areas we've talked about, the, the lockers, which I've titled sensitive case lockers, the evidence control unit, and the evidence processing room, 
the evidence processing room is the least secure facility of those three. If you mean by least secure that more people have access to it, then yes, that's accurate. It's also the most accessible from the outside through that big door that opens up, correct? Well, it's as, access as accessible as our stock room is, which also has one of those doors nearby. Now, and the, the stock room area is right next to the evidence processing room, correct? Yes. And there is a refrigerator in that stock room, is there not? Yes, there is a refrigerator freezer. It, and that refrigerator is available for criminalists to store biological evidence that might be kept in the evidence processing room, correct? It's available for them to use that, yes. Uh, let me go to the next slide, please. Now, which, item, which item is this numeric, uh, alphabetically? L. L. <coughs> appears to be a photograph. Yeah, Mr. Matheson, this is a photograph of the evidence processing room, is it not? Yes, it is. And there are things in the back there that look a little like ovens, I guess. I, what are those? Those are hoods, what are called hoods. It's a... a uh, area where air is drawn out of and ducted to the outside. And what's the purpose of those areas? It's not really relevant. Oh, well. Those are available for criminals if they lar bring large bloody items or smelly items to hang in that area so that they can dry out and that the, the fumes and the hazards associated with that are taken to the outside rather than being allowed to circulate within the laboratory. Now, uh, clothing, or bloody clothing is required to be dried thoroughly before it is packaged, correct? Not relevant. Yes. And what can happen if it's not allowed to dry thoroughly and then it's packaged? Well, if it's packaged while it's still damp, uh, you have the possibility for degradation of the biological evidence. can also cause mold to grow, can it? Well, sure. If you have dampness in there, that's one of the things that will occur. Now, the, the shirt that I, I believe you were asked some questions about, Mr. Goldman's shirt on direct, do you recall that? Yes, I do. And that was collected by the coroner's office, was it not originally? To my understanding, yes. And when was the first time approximately that you examined that shirt? The best of your recollection. Probably sometime in July or August, I'm not sure. And is it accurate that the first time you opened up the package that contained that shirt, there was a very strong odor <coughs> of mold? There was definitely an offensive odor, yes, smelled. And that's an indication that it was not packaged properly, isn't it? It's an indication that it was damp, it was allowed to stay damp for a while. That it was not packaged properly, correct? That it was not stored uh, properly then. Okay. <coughs> The area at the end that we've been talking about are, I, th I think you said they were hoods? Yes. And it's actually, uh, uh, I believe it's almost a walk-in area, isn't it? You can climb in there and... Yeah, the sashes, the area actually goes all the way to the ground. The sashes allow you to, to lift them up and actually roll something into it, if you like. What type of a hood is that? There are different types of hoods, aren't there? Not relevant. Oh, well. I'm not sure what you mean by what type of hood. Do you know what a laminar flow hood is? Roughly, yes. <coughs> What's your understanding of what a laminar flow hood is? Well, my understanding of a laminar flow is something that where you have air pulled across the surface and then removed. We have laminar flow in the lab. In what room? In most of the laboratories. In the serology lab? Yes.
the, the doors on that hood close, do they not? You can close it off, yes, by pulling the sashes down. So you can put uh, items that may be wet with blood in there, close the hood, turn on the ventilation system to allow them to dry, correctly? Uh, correct? Well, the, the hoods are there for hanging things up to dry, but you don't turn it on. Uh, they're constantly running. But the, the reason they're running and when you put items in there is to facilitate the drying process. To facilitate the drying process along with, like I mentioned, the removal of uh, uh, odors. And isn't one of the purposes also to prevent, to, to have the doors closed, to prevent any contamination of items that might be outside that hood with particles of blood or other biological material that might be on that clothing? This isn't relevant. Was there anything put in the hood, to your knowledge, with regard to this case? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Let's proceed. that on the, I believe on the morning of June 14th, there were two other cases being processed in the evidence processing room at the same time the Simpson case evidence was being processed, correct? That's in my notes? Yes. I would want to refer to that. Why don't you take a look? Yes, that is a reference on what is L507 of a chronology that I made, dated 6-14-94. I mentioned the two other cases with evidence present in evidence processing room. And is it, is it fair to assume that those two other cases had biological evidence as well? I'm not sure that we can assume that, no. Now, why did you make that notation? Just to try and be as complete as possible. But you made the notation without writing down what kinds of cases that involved? That's correct. And so we have no way of reconstructing at this point in time what kind of other evidence from other cases, including potential biological materials, might have been in, this, in that room at the same time as the evidence from this case. No, that's not necessarily true. You, know, you, you could determine that? I, it's possible, yes. But you did not consider it important enough to put in your notes at the time you made that notation? No. Next slide, please. Now, this slide is. is this, um, M? M? This is a picture of the uh, evidence processing room from the other side, correct? That's correct. And that roll up door there is the one we've been talking about that uh, is the door that goes to the outside. That's correct. Now, you recall in August of last year, I believe it was the. 26th or around that time, there was a visit to the lab by a number of defense experts and attorneys. I'm not sure the exact date, <laughs> but yes, it was a visit where we gave a tour of the facility. And do you recall whether or not that roll-up door was open at the time that tour was done? Not relevant. No, I do not. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now I'm going to blow up a little area back by Mr. Sheck's head, which is the cabinet where the evidence in this case, the swatch evidence, was dried, correct? Yes. All right, this is in. All right, Mr. Bush, you need, you need to tell us for the record which one we're referring to. Okay, I'm trying to convert the numbers to letters, Jets. I'm having some trouble. All right. And could we have, oh. Now this is a better picture of that cabinet, correct? It's a picture of the doors open, yes. Now that cabinet does not have any lock on it at all, does it? No, it does not. And when it's used for drying biological stains, does it have those other items in it as well that are in, the, in this picture? Yes. 
And are there chemicals kept in that cabinet at the same time that biological evidence is in there drying? Yes, there is. What sorts of chemicals are in there? They are the chemicals that we use for our field testing, the phenolphthalein test that's been talked about. If there's anything else, I'm not sure what it is. 